Good morning. I'd like to uh, thank the moderator for lowering the microphone. <laughs> it's still a quarter inch high. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank the church for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to preach this yeah. morning. And uh, uh, thank you for the prayers and the cards. And uh, just continue to do that. Continue to pray for all the ones that's our duty to pray for. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. My text is the need for the resurrection. And. Uh, Two verses, verses five and six. And I'll read those, have a prayer, and we'll jump right into the message. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man of the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask you to be with this meeting this weekend, Heavenly Father. Be with all the preachers. and Heavenly Father, just give them the words of encouragement, the things that they have need to say. Heavenly Father, I ask you to be with me as I preach the word this morning. Heavenly Father, I ask for the voice and I also ask for the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit in this message. Lord, I ask you to be with the hearers as well. Lord, I just ask you to be with all the ones that are due to pray for. And Lord, I just ask you that I'm praying that, that everything that is said and done here will be according to your glory and bring you praise and honor. And I ask you these things in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. As we look, uh, as we look at the news and world conditions as we believers unarguably see the need for Jesus Christ. We see a need for the resurrection. And uh, uh, the message on this need of the resurrection, it is not one of these popular messages that is preached in our modern pulpits today. That's right. We always preach on, and, and in most churches, uh, they always preach on uh, the good things and the love and the grace and the mercy, and, and they always preach on sin. People, you need to understand why they are being saved. And yes, it is true that God loves you, but it is because of your sin is because uh, is why Christ died and rose again the third day. We see all the way through the world and on the news stations every day how wicked and sinful the nation is and the whole world at that. We hear and see wars and rumors of wars and Israel's in war again right now. As uh, uh, all them countries around uh, God's people is wanting to have war with them. There's protests in our colleges, in our universities, including professors enticing these things to go on. And it is wickedness. It's sin. It's depravity. And a lot of these college students, if you pay attention to what some of them are doing and, and some of their lifestyles, I would love to see them go over to Hamas and do the very same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Amen? We also have anti-Semitism. A lot of college kids that are Jewish are scared and worried about their lives. And matter of fact, other individuals and, and had, had gathered in the streets for support for Israel. And many of these individuals got beaten up. We live in a depraved, sinful world. We also have mass shootings. The latest one, as you all have heard, had been up there in May. We have all kinds of drug abuse coming across the southern border. There's child abuse still yet. And the list goes on and on and on. The problem in the world is not global warming. The need to go solar and get rid of our natural resources is not, it is not the problem. We can have more gun laws, more policies, more things coming out of our government and laws, and that's not going to solve 
the problem. Amen. The problem is, is that in America and around the world, it is a nation rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. They continuously, Amen. continuously reject Jesus Christ. Ever since they started putting God out of schools back in the 70s, our country and our children have been going downhill. Amen. And the depravity of man, the sinfulness of man, of mankind has been on the increase and getting more wicked and wicked. <clears throat> the need for the resurrection lies in a three-letter word called sin. We also call this the total depravity of man. I want to go through a few simple things that I've dotted down and, and, and uh, some scriptures. and I may have to cut myself short, but uh, uh, if you have pen and paper, write these things down, write the verses down, and, and that way you can take it home and look these things up. Uh, simple definition from the text. Uh, I want to read that text again. It says, And God saw that wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. When, it, uh, when, he, when God had repented of, of making man upon the earth, it wasn't that he's going to change his mind. It was just that he was simply sorry that he made man and man became so deprived in such a short time. And the simple, I want to give you a couple of definitions. Simple defi uh, a simple definition of the word sin. The simple definition of it is, called, it is the lack of conformity to God. It is also called an act, an attitude, and this is where it really hits home. We don't want to hear this, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. But it says, it is an act attitude or disposition which fails to completely fulfill or measure up to the standards of God's righteousness and holiness. Sounds a lot like our churches, don't it? Amen. Amen. Another definition is it's in, in the Bible it's called the transgression of the law. You see that in First John chapter 3, verse 4. Now, the Apostle John says, it is, uh, the sin, of, sin is the transgression of the law. And before the law was the transgression of God's moral law. <clears throat> what is meant by the word told to pray? That's not a Bible word. It is a theological word. And I'm not a theologist. But listen to this. It, the definition of total depravity denotes man's sinful nature usually in connection with the doctrine of original sin, sinfulness, corruption, or pollution of one's nature. The doctrine of depravity asserts that people are, as a result of the fall, not inclined or even able to love God wholly, without heart, mind, and strength. Every aspect of our body does not want to love God. The natural man receiveth not the things or the spiritual things of God. Their foolishness Amen. to Amen. Also, but rather he is inclined to nature and, and by nature to serve their own will and desires and reject God's will. In Romans chapter, and I'm not going to read this, in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through chapter 3, verse 23, you write that down. You have time. You read that. You want to talk about a lot of negatives? There's a lot of negatives in those verses. Every verse is filled with a negative. You know why? Because it talks about your sin. It talks about my sin. Listen. Just because we are church members, just because we are saved, does not mean we are sinners. And the world actually realizes that. One word from this text in, in, the, in Genesis here, and I'll get into my message. One word I want to cover. It says that the, uh, the thoughts and the intents of the heart is evil continually. In verse 5. Also in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. I want to read that after 
Noah, uh, after God had flooded the earth and, and, and Noah's ark uh, came on dry ground. But in eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 21, uh, God said this, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground for any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. God Himself said that man's heart is evil from his youth. Continuously. It is our sin nature. It is what has been imputed to us. It is the depravity of man in the world. Also, concerning the heart, many times God has said concerning the Israelite children in the Old Testament, He said, they worship Me with their lips, but what? Their heart is far from Me. Can I tell you? Again, sounds like a regular church service to me. <laughs> huh? Amen. Listen, let me take, give you a couple more real quick. In Psalms chapter 23, verse 7, it says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, he says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And there's another portion of Scripture that, that it talks about out of the heart brings out many of the things that defile a man. And, it, and that uh, the Pharisees accused them for not washing their hands being in the cornfield and eating the, eating the corn or, or the wheat. And uh, they were just having trouble over not having worse hands. And Jesus told them that, you know, eating without, eating with dirty hands, and every one of us as a kid has done that before. We have. And uh, he said, eating with worse hands, unworse hands, he does not defile you. But what does defile is what's in your heart. Amen. And it comes Amen. out through your body. Amen. That defiles man. And we see that tremendously in society today in the world. There are three types of sin that I want to cover, cover here real quick. Three types of sin that covers the sinfulness and depravity of man. Number one, it is called inherited sin. Inherited sin. The sinful state in which we were born. We get this inherited sin from our parents, our grandparents, all the way back to Adam. How many of y'all ever heard the old saying, like father, like son, like mother, like daughter? If you, all, if you go back into the book of Acts, you'll find out whenever in Acts chapter 7, when uh, uh, Stephen was given his uh, sermon, and debate to the Sanhedrin. And when he got down to the very end of it, he, uh, he got through it and he, he just throwed out the application there in verse 51 through 53, somewhere in there. And he said, he said, ye stiff necked and hard of heart, ye do always resist the Holy Spirit. Just as your fathers have done, so do ye. Can I tell you, an inherited, inherited sin Sometimes the younger children or the grandchildren will inherit the sins of you. They watch what you do. There's a story where this little boy was walking behind his daddy's footstep and he was trying to take him great big long footsteps and trying to match his daddy's footsteps. And he had a little old thing in his hand. And his mother sat and saw him doing that. And he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm being just like my daddy. He's drinking beer, so am I. The dad heard that. He never, he put the can of beer down, threw it away, and never touched it again. Started going to church, and that whole family got saved. Listen, folks, these kids, these children and grandchildren, they, you think they don't pay attention to you, but they do, and you know they do. They do pay attention. And listen, 
that when they get to the age of monkey see, monkey do, they will imitate you in everything that you do. In Psalms 51 verse 5, I'm just going to try to quote this from memory. But when David was confessing his sin concerning Bathsheba, he said, he said I was shaken in iniquity. I was born in sin. It is inherited sin. It goes all the way back from our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, all the way back to Adam. And every part of man is affected by the sin nature. Folks, we do need the resurrection. We do need the resurrection. The second point I want to bring to you this morning is a, is a word called imputed sin. Imputed sin. The imputed sin means attribute or reckon or ascribe something to someone. A lot of people don't realize this. They know, but they don't understand how it works. But uh, Adam's sin is imputed to us individually. Because he sinned and ate the tree of fruit willingly, and in his posterity, we sin, just like whenever Abraham paid tithes, to Melchizedek, his children had paid tithes to Melchizedek. Also, there's some verses of Scripture I want to go to with that of the Ten Romans. Matter of fact, I may go ahead and do that real quick. Go to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. This is a familiar passage. And many of y'all know this passage. Some of you may not. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. Uh, I'm just going to read a couple, two, three verses, starting at verse 12. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men. For they all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Who is the figure of him that was to come? In other words, uh, mankind has, has got imputed sin from, from Adam all the way back in the Garden of Eden. And listen, even though, because, listen, even though we may not sin in the same similitude that Adam had sinned, it still means we're still sinners. That's what that basically means. We're still sinners. And we still have sin. I've seen this individual say, and this list. Imputed sin. Some people want to claim up and jump up and say, I've never done this and I've never done this. Matter of fact, some people may, may be able to say, I've never had a drink of alcohol. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never had to uh, go around bars. I've never chased wild women. I've never did this. And I've, never, I've done everything I was supposed to do. I never took guns. I was not that bad. But I'm telling you, you're just as depraved as the man that did all those things. Amen. You're just as sinful in God's eyes without Jesus Christ. That's true. <clears throat> Concerning imputed sin, there are three imputations I want to give you real quick. There's three imputations that are said in Scripture. The sin of Adam is imputed to us. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 14. I just read that. And then the sin of man is imputed to Christ. We see that in Isaiah 53, verse 5. Matter of fact, most of Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 12, has that. That the Lord God had laid on him the iniquity of us all. God imputed my sin and God imputed your sin upon Jesus Christ when He was hanging on the cross and was dying on the cross, shedding His blood. And remember when there was darkness for three hours? Nobody could go anywhere. Nobody could see anything. That was exactly when He was buried by your sins. 
And that is exactly when God had turned his head away from his son. <clears throat> and all hell was bringing everything down upon the Son of God. And he willingly bore our transgressions. He bore our iniquity. He bore our sin. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. The third one is that the Lord, matter of fact, the third one, the righteousness of God is imputed to those who believe. I like that part. The righteousness of God is imputed to those who believe. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, I don't know ain't going there, but Abraham, the Bible says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for what? Righteousness. How will you and I get righteousness? It's to believe what God says in this book. Mm -hmm. I, we went on visitation the other day over in Cedarville and we ran into this individual. He was the most hateful, obnoxious individual I'd ever seen in my life for a long time. But he utterly just basically told me I don't believe in that garbage leave. I don't believe in that. I don't believe what you say and I don't care anything about Jesus Christ. Then I found out he was from Pennsylvania and that goofy. But anyway. <laughs> I had to throw that in there. I hope nobody's from PA here. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> The righteousness of God is imputed to those who believe. In Psalms chapter 32, verse 2, it says, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let me tell you, any righteousness that God sees in this individual right here, it's not mine. Amen. It's God's. Amen. It's Jesus Christ. It's His blood that covers. Anything, now just like the Apostle Paul said, anything that, that I do that is good, it's not me that doeth it, it's Jesus Christ that dwelleth in me. <laughs> but anything bad that I do, it's not Jesus Christ that dwelleth in me, but it's the lust of the flesh that I do this. And that is me. The third thing, I hope it's the third thing that I want to give you real quickly, is that personal sins. Personal sins. Boy, I tell you, <laughs> when the preacher starts preaching on personal sins, you can see the congregation's faces get red. <laughs> you can see their heads swelling up, turn <laughs> red. They start blowing out that nostril like an old raging bull. <laughs> They're just happy as a lark, ain't they? Metal and old preachers ain't no good if they are. They? I'm gonna meddle just a little bit, not much. Concerning personal sins, do you realize personal sins bring home the reality of sin? It brings home the reality of sin. And when it comes to personal sins, even though our sins are forgiven, and the world shows their personal sins openly. We show our personal sins privately. We show our personal sins and then guess what? We as Christians make excuses over it. Huh? I didn't even get an amen out of that. I'm part <laughs> All right. Many passages, and listen to this. This is, this is interesting. I'm not going to read off, but you can just about turn on every page of the New Testament and many passages list personal sins. Let me give you just a few. Lying, pride, different types of abuses, covetousness, unforgiving spirit, jealousy, envy. The list goes on and on and on and on. And what's terrible is that because you and I are saved, we still have the old sin nature and sometimes we give in to these things. And then... 
before I say this point, before you all get mad at me, let me tell you this. How many of y'all agree that Israel in the wilderness was a type of the church in the world today? Mm -hmm. Y'all believe that? I do. They, they were symbolic of the church today in the world. Matter of fact, while they was in the wilderness, guess what? Moses had, God had Moses to tell His people Israel. He said, because of your sin and the deceitfulness of your heart, and I'm using short sleeve language, which you're going to get to get just over here, but because of your sin and your actions, your adulteries, your idolatries, the Gentiles, the heathen, blaspheme my name. That's right. I kind of wonder how many church members today causes more depravity of personal sins in the lost people's lives because of the way we live. Think about that. I got a haircut earlier last week and uh, there's this man in the barber in there and I always was looking for an opportunity to talk to him. But I wouldn't do it because of the type of person he was and other people was there. And matter of fact, he even opened up the conversation. And I asked him, I said, have you ever been to church? Because I know he didn't. He said, I went a couple times to another one, a church down the road where my, I think it's still his girlfriend, not his wife, that he's living with. Where his girlfriend goes. And he said, I don't really have much for church. Because when I know individuals that goes to church, there's deacons, and especially the preachers that comes in to get a haircut. The things that come out of their mouth and what they talk about, mm -hmm. I don't want nothing to do with church. Mm -hmm. That was just early last week, <clears throat> late last week. Folks, we need to be careful on how we live inside the church and outside of the church. Amen. Because we may cause the depravity of man to get worse ourselves. All right, I'm going to get off of that. Last, and I'm almost done. Last, again, why we need the resurrection. Why do we need the resurrection? I want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me and I'll quit. First, I'll quit here in a few minutes. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this is also a very familiar verse with a lot of people. I want to start at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. The Apostle Paul says this, Now if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some of you among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not Christ raised. And if Christ not be raised, listen to this, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then also they which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only, we have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. A couple things I'm going to bring out of this. What the, why do we need the resurrection? The resurrection assures us that God accepted Jesus' atonement for sin on the cross. Amen. It also proves the forgiveness of sin mm -hmm. that Christ took on us. Amen. We are no longer under the penalty of sin. And this is the great part. We are no longer under the penalty of sin, the power of sin, or the enslavement of sin. Jesus Christ took all of that away. And we have what is called the Holy Spirit 
that has come into sight of our heart and lives within us and teaches us to do these things. And listen, the same power that, that the early church had, the same power that the apostles had, the same power that Jesus Christ had, you and I have living within us. And He gives that to us to conquer the sin that is in our life. The only problem is we don't use that power. We don't use it because we run after the lust of our flesh and the lust of our heart. The resurrection also gives us a lively hope that someday we will be with Christ in heaven and not in hell. Like Apostle Paul said, if this is the only time that we have hope, we're of all men most miserable. But our hope, because of the death, burial, and the resurrection, our hope lies that we know because Jesus Christ raised from the dead, He's going to come back, and one day, if we are in the graves, we ourselves will be raised up, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with Him, and the Bible says forever we'll be with the Lord. Listen, that's our hope. That's our peace. That's our comfort. And that's why we need the resurrection. One more point then. Concerning the judgments of God. Concerning the judgments of God. The holy judgments of God rest upon all men outside of Christ. Every man, man that is depraved and will, unwillingly to receive Jesus Christ as their uh, personal Savior is going to fall underneath condemnation and judgment. The holy judgments of God rest upon all men outside of Christ. Though these holy judgments of God cannot be dismissed or diminished, the sinner may be saved from all, the, all through Christ. This is the good news, and this is the gospel. The death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. We need the resurrection. Brother Mark.